The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. message today. Uh, I'm titling it, Two Are Better Than One. Very simple message, but I believe that God is taking us into deeper, more implicit relationships that are faith-based, faith-based relationships, obviously. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20 is well known as the, the Great Commission, and it says, going into all the world and... Uh, make disciples, and uh, we taught this in uh, in one of our books on the ancient blueprint. That what was interesting is is these young Gentiles, all of a sudden, who had no history, no Ten Commandments, no anything, uh, were were coming to Jesus as their Messiah, and then they were being discipled. And what was interesting is, as the process began, it was like a father with his children regardless of chronological age. It didn't have anything to do with that. As a matter of fact, when John says, I speak to you little children, I speak to you young men, I speak to you fathers, he wasn't referring to chronological age. He was was referring to the spiritual development of individuals. And uh, it was interesting that if the the mentor uh, was discipling a young disciple after a very short period of time, uh, there was a relationship. He called them my child. And one of the old rabbi sayings was, your earthly father can bring you into this world, but it's the spiritual fathers and mentors that teach you how to live in this world. Now, so hopefully, the goal is that they're one and the same. It would be wonderful for the parents to raise their children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. But that was a very popular saying at that time because the church was in its infancy and it was being birthed by people who sometimes, and you know this, Jesus said the same thing, sometimes their enemies were in their own household. (laughs) Not everybody's a believer, not everybody is real pleased when someone becomes a believer. Now, I was very fortunate. They were all against me and my family, but little by little, I won. (laughs) And mother, father, sisters all ended up uh, receiving Jesus as Lord and Savior, but not without a battle. I can remember my mild, easygoing father who was the the quietest, softest-spoken man and actually really set a good example as an unsaved man on how to treat a woman. He, He was a beautiful example. Uh, When I was a young kid, I thought he wasn't cool enough and he wasn't tough like my buddy's fathers were, you know, that would get in brawls and stuff. And then I looked and I saw later on that really wasn't that appealing. And my dad would put an apron on and do the dishes for my mother. And I can remember even when my mom was, uh, um, uh, didn't have much longer to live, my dad would cry, but it was because. Uh, she was already going delirious, and she was asking him to do things that he wasn't capable of doing because they were impossible. And he wept because he wanted to please her so much. But he couldn't do what she was. She said, uh, Lloyd, take the dog out. But we don't have a dog. <laughs> you know, it was like, and he would cry because he wanted to do what she said. He, he just lived to please her. And uh, it was a very beautiful thing to watch. But I believe God's speaking relationship, and without Jesus, the relationships are really uh, nice. That's about all you can say, nice relationships. And when I think of nice uh, as a relationship and not spiritual, um, I think that uh, even the, uh, the title of this message, Two Are Better Than One. Uh, my grandfather was a, a, a detective uh, policeman in South Chicago during the Capone era. So, you know, he didn't have it easy. But he used to take me as a little boy, to, and after he retired, he would take me to his partner's house, Paul Prince. I can still remember that name. And, you know, it is like you see on TV, uh, you know, a partner has somebody's back. 
and they're there for you. In the military, you have a band of brothers, and you know you can count on it. And no greater love has any man than a man lay down his life for his friends. If, if policemen, firemen, military can have those kind of relationships, how much more should you have in Jesus, really? Two are better than one. And uh, I want to start off by uh, re really just kind of zeroing in on relationships because there's nothing worse than unequal yoking. Uh, that's when the relationships don't really match. And uh, one is always believing they're going to change the other person. That's usually a huge, huge mistake. Um, but in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, uh, this is a familiar portion of Scripture where it says, <clears throat> uh, Train up a child in the way that he goes, on the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, to me, uh, even the training, just what I've learned from discipling with believers, and as well as raising your own family, uh, that training really needs explained. And child, this verse reveals two ingredients. One, it's for rearing children, yes, but the first command is to train them up. That's the promise. Train them up in the way you should go, I mean the command. And secondly, the promise is, and when he is old, he shall not depart from it. Uh, an interesting thing is, in the Hebrew, the, the better word for child is actually dependent. I find that interesting. And, and then when he's no longer a dependent, he shall go. All right, well, what did this training involve? I mean, what, what made it effective? What made it ineffective? You know, the, the, this command, you know, God says, if you do this, I'll do that. You know, the promises aren't just blanket promises, and you don't have to do any of the commands. All right? That's the little promise box. I always said, I bet you the if in the stores, the Christian bookstores had commandment boxes, they probably wouldn't sell like the promise boxes would. You know, Everybody wants the promises, but it's God saying, if you do this, I'll do this. All right. But now, <clears throat> uh, this is a prescription for raising children, but how about raising dependents in order to get them independent? And there's three very powerful elements in this scripture that would be easy to overlook. And the concept of training or train up does not involve uh, punishment, but it includes three major ideas. The first one is dedication. Now, this is a consistent word throughout the Old Testament, child training must begin. Do you remember uh, Hannah brought young Samuel? Uh, dedicate. When you dedicate it to God, probably the most powerful truth for raising your children, having friends, this applies to covenant relationship of one sort or another. But in the training process, one is independent, and the other is considered a dependent. And the first thing she did was she offered that child to the Lord. Dedication. This is a very important part. When we traveled, we had little cards printed out because we saw such a weakness in the body of Christ understanding that you don't own anybody. God owns them. Some of the current trendy things that ladies say is, well, it's my body. No, it may be your body, but if you're, you're a child, that's God's child, not yours. He belongs to him and not to you. And we used to print on our little cards, Romans 14.4 from the Living Bible Translation seemed to get it across. We saw confusion between ownership and stewardship. And lesson number one in training and being truly equipped as a disciple, as a parent, as a friend even, would be to know... And quite frankly, you really can't be a friend with your child. One of the big mistakes is parents try to be their friend. You can be their friend after you've trained them and they become what? Independent. 
And you say, well, they're always my child. Yeah, but once they're independent, you don't own them. They're God's property. And here's Romans 14, 4. So I'm going to say it because I take for granted most Kingdom Life Church people have heard this over and over again. Because it was so necessary when we went church to church, the confusion between ownership and stewardship. You were called by God to be a steward, not an owner. So dedication, dedicating your children to the Lord means that they're, Romans 14, 4, they are God's servants, not yours. They belong to him and not to you. And God is able to tell them whether they're right or wrong, and God is able to make them do as they should. Huh. So you're, you're not God to them, are you? But you are going to be accountable to God for them as to how you train them. Now, uh, the first thing is, is uh, recognizing stewardship. And Jason's has some good messages on stewardship. Uh, stewardship compared to ownership. We belong to God and he's entrusted us with relationships. That's marriage, friendship, children, what have you. Uh, he expects you to be a steward of those things that he's placed in your life. And uh, the second thing from dedication was, uh, you know, train up a child. Element number one is that I am not an owner of this child. I, God's placed them in my hands to be a steward. This also applies to disciples, of which, what did the Great Commission say? Go ye into all the world, make disciples. It's not an option. It was a command. So in other words, you say, well, I don't have any children. Well, you better have some spiritual children. There better be somebody you invested in because you are made that way. Now, um, and quite frankly, uh, particularly mothers, fathers too, but mothers particularly, you cannot be a friend with your child until they're independent. Biggest mistake you can make is instead of being the, the, the instructor or the adult or the parent with a, with a dependent is to get down to their level and think you're just going to have fun together. You can have fun but somebody has to be the adult. Somebody has to be the apparent. Somebody has to do the training and the rearing and know that they stand before God for it, whether you're in uh, the, the church in leadership or whether you're in a family member. And like my uh, grandfather showed me, just think of, of the policemen and the, and the fire department and Boy, I'd want to know someone was having my back when I'm facing life and death situations, wouldn't you? I'd want to know that I could trust them. So, quite frankly, if I'm involved in friendships, it's going to be that kind of a relationship, not some of the fair weather friends who are there when everything's going good, but the first sign of trouble, they're somewhere else. All right? So, so the first element is knowing stewardship over ownership or dedication. And that's clearly shown in the Bible as we dedicate our children. We're telling God that, yes, I may have given birth to this like Hannah, but young Samuel belongs to the Lord. Dedication. Uh, secondly, uh, parents are to instruct or cause their children to learn everything that is essential to please God. Because you can get real religious on them and give them all kinds of rules and regulations, but the primary responsibility, and this would be good for discipling someone, teach them what is pleasing to God. This is good, this is evil. Teach them what is pleasing to God is the proper type of instruction. And uh, my favorite, that I've, I've preached this for 40 years, my favorite, when I looked at this uh, scripture years ago, uh, it says, the third thing is proper motivation. I look for that in the congregation. I look for the people that are the want to, not the have to. Not someone you have to keep putting the fire under them. Not someone you chase after. As a matter of fact, I don't believe in chasing after. I believe you do more harm. The father did not run after the prodigal, did he? 
But was he willing and waiting? Yes. Did he love them? Yes. But he knew, you know what? Until that person comes to themselves. I remember my uh, spiritual father said, if you chase somebody, you're, you're going to teach them a habit to run always. And then they will use that on you that every time they want their way, they'll leave home. Hmm? If it works. But if you do like my mom did, here's your bags. See ya. That didn't work real well. <laughs> well, by golly, she ain't changing her mind. <laughs> this doesn't work. This was like me pouting. I used to have a bottom lip that you could trip over. And when I was real young, I got my way. Whoa, you don't want to do that because then every time you want your way, you go. Until it doesn't work anymore. And I was asking Jennifer, I said, what about, uh, what, what do you do with a child that pouts? You know? And uh, she says, simple. You let them know, I know exactly what you're doing. And then you explain to them what they're doing because they're manipulating. It's control, it's manipulation. You say, I know what you're doing. You're doing this because this. You're pouting because I didn't give you an extra cookie. Well, guess what? No cookies. You're trying to rule me when I'm trying to train and discipline you. You're going to learn respect. And until you learn respect for the ones who are your parents, mentors, pastors, whatever, you'll, you'll, you'll never amount to anything. You, you will keep using that, and then you'll transfer that into the world, into the workplace, into the marketplace, and you'll have difficulty with interpersonal relationships because you never really learned respect. Now, uh, this motivation, uh, uh, this instruction, teach everything that's pleasing to God. I love reading uh, Witness Lee's uh, translation of the Bible. He, he uses a word that uh, other translators don't, don't use very often, enjoy. Almost every other, and for this reason, we enjoy God. And for this reason, God says, you can enjoy my, pr- enjoy, enjoy, enjoy. All of that was according to doing what he said to do, then you enjoy. I'm going, hey, that's a no-brainer then. Why don't we just all obey God all the time and enjoy the relationship and enjoy life? Oh, maybe that's the abundant life. Maybe the problem is if I don't obey, things don't go well. (laughs) But if I obey, things go well and I can enjoy Often it was said to uh, some of the people who are the worst at relationship are usually the ones that have the foremost demonic attacks. And I liked, I can't remember who it was, but someone said, most of those are not demonic attacks. It's your, it's your carnal flesh beating you up. You know, deal with your flesh. <laughs> You'll have less demonic attacks. How come major leaders do not get as much demonic attack as someone on the periphery who struggles relationally. They're always under attack. Makes me question, maybe you have open doors. Maybe there's some things to resolve in order to say no weapon formed against me is going to prosper. You know, this stuff comes against you, but learning how to respond. So dedication, stewardship would be the first thing in, in training and uh, uh, working with a dependent and uh, making a clear distinction. Get that card written out. Write that Bible verse out if you need it because it's one of the biggest traps for even seasoned Christians to fall into is ownership. My ministry, my job, my husband, my wife. You may be in union, but you don't own them. There's a difference, isn't there? Now, the instruction was to teach them everything that pleases God. And I watched in the, in the early church, uh, in our book, The Ancient Blueprint, it covers that. It says, this is right. They're taking people with no background whatsoever, and they're training them. They're saying, my child. So I see there's a loving emphasis going in. And they're treating them as a responsibility before God, these mentors. And as a mother or a father, Paul, uh, 
interestingly enough, did not seem like the gentle, fuzzy, warm type when uh, you looked at his life prior to conversion, did it? He was out killing them Christians. You know, he was... But yet, in, in Thessalonians, he says, like a mother, we nurtured you with the gospel. And like a father, we did such a... So he equated the both parental roles, regardless of his gender, as part of the nurturing process. And that brings us to the next point. That word, uh, the third element, is motivation. There's dedication, then there's the instruction in the things that are pleasing to God. And obviously, anything in the will of God, His will is His pleasure. You want to bring somebody into pleasure, teach them what the will of God is. What does the Word of God say the will of God is? And then to what degree are you entering into it? And if you're really struggling bad, ask yourself, did I obey the last thing that he told me? <laughs> All right. Especially if you say, I can't hear. I don't know what God's saying. Well, what was the last thing he told you? How are you doing with that? <laughs> okay. Now, this third element is motivation. And uh, for someone like myself where discernment is very key in this whole relational thing, uh, it always deals with the source. The source of a thing, not the actual words or the circumstances, but what was the source of those. And as far as motivation, the word used to describe to train was the action of a midwife who would stimulate the palate of a baby. with Put oil on her finger, a little olive oil, and a baby that wouldn't nurse. She would caress the palate of the baby's mouth until the child wanted, wanted, wanted to nurse. Wanted. She created a desire. You want to see three elements for raising somebody? First of all, they have to want what you have got. Hmm? You have to create a desire in them for to want it. There's a whole lot of religious upbringing that, quite frankly, most rebel because they go, I don't want that. I didn't see the love, I saw the rules. Now, a lot of times there could be love and rules, and they would still rebel. But if you gave the kind of uh, love that was necessary, and they see that you have a standard, that pleasing God is still your ultimate standard, they can return. They can see that pleasing God is where my mother and my father was. And this is true of former friendships and relationships. First of all, you don't own them. Second of all, you will be unequally yoked if your hunger and thirst is to please God and theirs is a little bit too much friendship with the world. Friendship with the world is being an enemy against God. So you, you can't equally join flesh and spirit like that. They love the world. You, you're not going to be as close to them as you may want to be. You can love them, but it's going to be pretty much one way because what, what would it require for it to be a real union or communion? It would require just like the prodigal and the father. That father loved that prodigal. Sat, it's like, kind of like he's sitting on the porch just waiting for him to turn, but he did not chase after him to try to make him change. That only pushes him farther away. But it says, to train up a child in the way he shall go, and when he grows old, he shall not depart. When he grows old means after he's independent. The promise is, if you train them this way, and if they respond to that training, then the promise is fulfilled. But the condition is important. The uh, recipient of that training as a child, it'd be better to use that word, dependent. That's what it comes uh, from in the Hebrew. And the thought of that, at each stage of development, the parents or the guardians are to dedicate, instruct, and motivate. There's your three words. Dedicate, instruct, and motivate. Dedicate meaning you don't own them. You're a steward, though, so you are responsible. I, how many people we've seen crash and burn with over responsibility? What do they used to call them? Helicopter parents, people that parents that would hover over the child, parents that 
did not raise them to what would please God based on their individual gifting, but tried to make them a duplicate copy of themselves. Make them like them, or worse, I'm going to live my life that I feel missed out on, and I'm going to live them through them. Seeing fathers demand kids become sports-minded exactly the way they were. And, you know, maybe they're not. God's saying, raise them in such a way that you're motivated to create a desire for them to do what is right, to live a godly life, but also the bent that they have, the gifting, be developed in them. Not what you want. Not your likes and dislikes, but the bent that they have in there, nurture it, mature it. And if you have more than one child, obviously uh, it's going to be different. What you would do with one would be different than what you did with another. No. Uh, <clears throat> the content of the training in the way that he should go. The thought is that, actually Joshua said, as for me and my house, we're going to do what? Serve the Lord, okay? The command must be kept in order for the promise to be realized. And, and I saw th uh, three words in, in, uh, in this from God's point of view, and then I saw it from the devil's point of view. And I, I wrote this down. This was early in the morning, and I just scratched it down real quick. But I saw this dedicate, instruct, and motivate. And then I saw, well, what's the enemy doing at the same time? Because you know he's at work. God is at work, the enemy's at work. Well, the devil would want to destroy, intimidate, and manipulate. So there goes Dennis and his pouting. Well, I know what Dennis was doing. He was working more with the devil than with God, don't you think? Hmm? Because pouting was manipulating. Somebody needed to tell me what the source was. It might have scared me a little bit. Dennis, Dennis probably could have used a little stricter discipline. I think I got away with a little too much. All right. Except my mom had a good old Catholic strategy for me. And that was, I knew that I could outrun her. So every time I did something bad and I was going to get a licking, I'd run. She can't catch me. And she'd stand at the porch, on the front porch, and say, that's okay. God will get you. But then all I had to do was fall off my bike, right? Anything that went wrong, God got me. So probably need a lot of ministry on that after I got saved, but that's okay. And she'd say it was so calm and matter of fact, like, oh, man, can't, where, where are you going to run from God that you can't see, right? So anything that went wrong, God got the blame. Or my mother, either way. That's okay. God will get you. All right. So anyway, uh, but his job is to destroy and get you to function independent. He does not want relationships. You know, uh, we title this two are better than one. And, and all, all through the scriptures and all through life, that will hold true. And it's to me, it's just marvelous. You could take it from the secular realm, like I said, with police and firemen and military, and you could bring it into the spiritual realm, and it gets better in the spiritual realm. Because um, uh, <clears throat> it's more than just... Well, let's put it this way. One and one is two, or is it? <laughs> One and one can be two, but not all, does it have to be? For a threefold cord is not quickly broken. One and one is two, but not always. Because the value of a relationship or a friendship, what would happen if two people, one and one is not two according in the kingdom of God, in the spiritual realm. Now maybe, maybe a cop and his partner are two people. And they're relying on, on, on their own strength of relationship. But how much better in God? You have a threefold cord. One and one is three. Okay, all the kids go, oh, I don't know. I don't think of what he's talking about there. One and one are three. 
a threefold cord is not easily broken. If and if Jennifer and I were joined, now we're talking marriage, but it can be friendship. It can be parent and child. It can be any of these relationships. Wherever two, well, I know the scripture says two or three. Let's just keep it at two. Wherever two are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst. It's automatically three. So one and one is three. See, I can prove it. I can build a case for this, for this bad math. This is the new math. <laughs> but in the spiritual realm, one and one is two, or not necessarily always. But God says, what would happen? What would happen? Think about this. Okay, use some holy imagination here. What would happen if, if two people would cooperate? Now, I know this is going to stretch some of you. What would happen if two people cooperated, coordinated, and, oh, get this, communicated? What would happen if two people actually communicated? How many have ever seen a, a Hallmark movie? Anybody? Yeah. My favorite scene in any Hallmark movie, it's not my favorite, but it's like so predictable, is two people are coming together and it's meant to be, but this one eavesdrops, which is wrong in the first place, eavesdrops and here's this one talking on the phone saying, I'm going to take that job in New York. There goes our relationship and walk away. They walk away before they hear the whole thing. That's not communication. That's jumping to conclusions. That's paranoia. That's suspicion. It's the opposite of discernment. And this person says, however, I've fallen in love and I think I'm going to have to turn it down. <laughs> but they didn't hear that because they walked away in a huff. I've seen that in relationships over and over again. You see it with little children, and you see it with adults. Communication. It'd be amazing what could be accomplished with communication. Iron sharpens iron. That means that your friend might not always agree with you. I'm always worried about that relationally, is that what does gossip tend to do? It tends to poison. People don't search out the truth in the gossip. It has a tendency to poison. What you need is someone to say, have you gone to that person? Have you asked them? Have you talked to them? Real communication would have been, I don't care about the hearsay. What did you say? What did they say? You know, take these issues, God's secret of relationship is he wants to be involved in it. You have, you've got him so beat over the world, whether they're policemen, firemen, military people who have each other's back, a band of brothers and all as good as that can be, you have it better because you've got God in the mix. It's funny when you sit down with a a, a, a man and a woman, say there, there's a, the woman sitting here and the man sitting here, and they're talking to their pastor about their marriage. Inevitably, this one, the wife, wants to change the husband because there's a marriage problem. So obviously he's the bro. And then the man sees her as always wanting her way, and she's the problem. And they want you to solve or heal or counsel their marriage. But guess what? That's not the marriage over here. That's not the marriage over there. The marriage is this entity in the middle. So I have to talk to this invisible entity and say, marriage, why don't you get straightened out here? Don't you know what this one, what the wife said and what the husband said? That relationship in the middle is a separate entity and it's a very real thing. You don't, you can't address that. You cannot address an invisible entity and fix it. What you have to do is say, you, young lady, need to deal with your stuff. You, young man, need to deal with your stuff. That's how you heal the marriage. You've got to humble yourself and deal with your stuff. You've got to humble yourself and deal with your stuff. 
But the middle part, you can't do nothing with it. I can't believe people that go for marriage counseling and ask to heal the marriage. That's the end result of the two of you. <laughs> You've created an entity. But I can't get to that entity. But I can get to you, and I can get to you. Now, the value of a relationship is God said what? What did he say from the beginning? Two are better than one because he said, God, it's not good that man should be alone. So obviously he felt like there needed to be people in their life. Now, we, we taught it as the hierarchy of need. And uh, there's a lot of teaching on that. I'll just give you a quick overview. What we really need to understand is that the lower need has to be met before you can fulfill the higher need. And uh, my favorite quote was Jesse Penn Lewis who said, you'll never know the love of God until you've trusted him. The lower need is trust. And until you, you can't even know him experientially unless you trust him enough to come into your heart. At some point you're going to have to trust that he is who he says he is, his word is true, and I'm going to reach out and I'm going to embrace it and I'm going to ask him to come into my heart. So uh, we were predestined, we were called to a trust relationship. And if you want to know the love of God, you've got to start out with trust. Most people, even Christians, have very low trust levels. And when we used to travel church to church, we'd have altar calls. People come up and they'd say, I'm having trouble trusting God. You know, there's a whole not, not a whole lot I can do for you. I can't minister to love to you when you won't even trust to receive it. If you have a trust issue, it's you are the problem. God is not the problem. God is faithful. He'll never leave you or forsake you. You have to open up and trust. And when you do, it brings you to the second level. You can know the love of God in a far deeper, richer way than you've known him before. You go from trust to the love character. You go from a beginning relationship built on trust. Now, if, um, if I was married to uh, an alcoholic and they say, trust me, and uh, their pattern is every three months they fall off the wagon, no, trust has to be earned. And that's the way it is with friendships, with church families, with natural families. It needs to be earned. You can't make something happen. <clears throat> it has to be earned and proven, or the love is going to be from a distance, unfortunately. You can have loving intercession for some of your children, but in re reality, friendships and children cannot have that close relationship until there's a trust in God that can unite them. Third level, if you can trust God and you start to experience the love of God, you start to get conformed to his character and his nature, you begin to see the third level. You begin to see the value and the worth of that relationship and that you belong and because you belong, you've got a lot to give. That needs to be the truth for value or worth. People spend a lot of their Christian life feeling like they're unworthy. Well, that's insulting God, and that's saying you haven't trusted him or loved him deeply enough if you're still talking like that. Oh, I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. My righteousness is as filthy rags. I'm aware of all those scriptures, but I'm also aware that I am the righteousness of God in Christ. You know, you have to see that there's a balance to all of it. Um, and so we see that then your value or your worth will determine your performance as a friend, as a husband, as a wife, as a church member. I'm telling you, God's secret of relationship is two is better than one. And, and it's a profound truth. And it sounds simple to hear it, but it's profound in practice. Look in the natural realm. 
about two policemen like my grandfather taking me after he retired. His eyes were going. He had Parkinson's disease. He was in a, uh, I would have to drive him and drop him off at his friend's house, and he would take me in, and his friend was in a wheelchair. They were quite old. They had been retired for a number of years, but that was still his partner. That's my partner, Dennis, Pas uh, Paul Prince. He had my back. And my grandfather was in South Chicago during the Caponate. He wasn't dealing with minor issues as a police detective. He dealt with some famous cases. We had a whole scrapbook of him. Um, but that is nothing compared to what you could have in God as a believer. You should be challenged to say, what Dennis's grandfather had in the natural, I don't have anything like that as a Christian. Then you ought to say, why? Why not? Now, your performance as a believer, the way you function, will come out of how you value yourself. People that are ministering to other people, they value what God's placed in them. And they're a good steward. And they want to teach other people what God enjoys. And lastly, they want to motivate it. Now, motivation means from the heart. How many know people that gave up because of religion? Just gave up. Too many rules and regulations. My parents are too strict. But the proper training up of a child is that you teach them to function from the heart. You teach them that motivation needs to come from internal, not motivate, like from the devil's perspective, to manipulate control from the heart. Unless you forgive from the heart. Even a simple truth like that won't, won't take effect in the body of Christ until it's done from the heart, from the secret place. You do it from the head, it doesn't work. The name of Jesus in the flesh doesn't work. It has to be properly molded internally. So when you look at dedication, instruction, the motivation, you want to teach that friend that you function from the heart. You want to teach that child you function from the heart. It's what's internally motivating from the God inside, not externally what you think they would like or not like. And lastly, the purpose is, remember what was the promise? When they grow independent, they will not depart from it. If the lesson was taught properly, then the promise comes to pass. And the purpose is to reproduce according to kind. Your children, your friends, pretty much are going to resemble where you're at. And if you're a Christian and you're more friendly with people in the world than you are Christians, that speaks volumes as to heart problems. Because you reproduce according to your kind. You, you're supposed to be co-laboring with the Lord according to his purpose, to reproduce. And you can't give something you've never received. Now, here's something that I want us to write down because I want you to apply this to your marriage, to your Christian friends, um, family. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. Very simple. Two are better than one. There's five elements here. The first one is, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. Two are better than one because they have a good reward. There's provision. Boy, you could really, you could really go off on a tangent just on that. Most of your provision that comes from God is still going to come through people. And I can remember J.C. Penney's used to have a uh, thing that more customers were lost by a snotty clerk than by inferior product. 
Interesting, huh? So relationship, relationship, relationship. You communicate what you are on the inside. And you can poison people or you can bless people. But in the case of J.C. Penney's research, a snotty clerk does more damage than an inferior product ever did. Kind of hard to sell your product if you're going to have snotty clerks, <laughs> right? No. Two are better than one because there's provision. You be the best person you can be on a stinky old job, and I'll tell you what, God will bring the provision. Because attitude will determine your performance. You want to see provision in your life? Clean up your heart attitude. The blame game. As a believer, you need to die to that totally and completely. You want to see the provision of God relationally? You got to quit. Just like my grandfather, he says, um, my police partner had my back. Well, you got to quit stabbing people in the back if you really think you're going to if you're going to make any progress. Have their back instead of stabbing them in the back would be a good start. So there's provision. The second element is security. For if they fall, they will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone, because when he falls, there's no one to help him. People that can't maintain healthy relationships are alone. Uh, they're very insecure. Because there's a security. You treat God the way you treat people. You treat people the way you treat God. So if you're alone and you can't get along with anybody, guess who the problem is? You. Guess who's going to be on the short end of the stick? You. <laughs> Two are better than one. So you need to find out why. Why are relationships always traumatic with you? Why is it always a trauma? You want the security? The security is if one falls, the other one's there to pick them up. The third element is comfort. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? I can still remember one of the key elements of the character and the nature of God was that I am, I am the one who comforts you. Isaiah 51, um, 12, I believe. I am, I am. And then if he's the only one that can truly comfort, not hostess cupcakes or something like that, but if he's the only one, donuts, uh, if he's the only one that can comfort, I am, I am the comfort, and no one can comfort you but me, but then he tells us in relationship, comfort ye my people, comfort them with the same comfort whereby you are comforted. So you can't, again, if you've never been comforted by God in difficult situations, you've got nothing to offer anybody because the comfort they need has to be real. It has to be Holy Spirit. So there's a comfort. So there's provision, there's security, there's comfort. And though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. There's protection in it. If one can chase a thousand, two, ten thousand, that's not one and one is two, is it? If one can chase a thousand, to 10,000. There's some type of spiritual multiplication that needs to be understood. If two or more are gathered in my name, I am in the midst. God gets involved, and when he gets involved, you're not relying on your strength. The protection that's coming from him is far superior, and it multiplies exponentially. It's not addition. It's not one and one. It's when Two or more gather, I am in the midst. God is the multiple. Uh, I can go out and see to it that you're anointed to confront 10,000. That's pretty good. That's better than being alone, isn't it? That's just two of you coming together in him. The multiplication clicks in. Strength. Not only is there protection when one is overpowered by another, two can withstand him. You're to have each other's back as believers. You're to have each other's back as friends. But you better watch the friendship if it's equally yoked or not, because you can't be friendship with the world. You become an enemy against God. The fifth element 
is strength. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. <clears throat> the strength of unity, and that's what I believe God has been speaking to us for some season of time now. He's speaking to us to uh, sharpen our relationships, cleanse attitudes, wash your hands. Who will ascend the hill of the Lord? He has clean hands and a pure heart. This is a time of purification. We heard that uh, on our Tuesday night meeting, a lot of, to do with washing your sins white as snow, purify, purity. There's a cleansing that is required so that relationships can blossom. The weakness we saw in relationships when we traveled church to church was the blame game, which means Christians who are the most forgiven people on the face of the earth are not necessarily the most forgiving people. <laughs> the other thing we saw was ownership over stewardship. They didn't realize you don't own anything or anybody. And lastly, the motivation very often the motivation, even in the prophetic camp, a lot of prophecy was anger-based, straightening people out. I'll tell you what, when God straightens me out, I still feel the love of all the love of heaven behind it. A, even a corrective word should have the love of God behind it. His nature, the source, the source, the source. You can't overlook the source for accuracy of words. The devil could quote scripture, and the scripture could be accurate, but you know there's something wrong with the source. It's coming from the devil. Now, one friend plus another plus Jesus, that makes a cord that's not easily broken. And our commitment to Jesus actually binds us together. You want, you want your relationships to be strong, friendships, children, mother, then it has to be bound together with Jesus. He has to be the source of quality real really quality relationship. And our, our commitment to Jesus binds us together. We find our oneness in him. And uh, again, John 17, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world might believe that you sent me. How's the, the world might believe that you sent me based on seeing their relationship? seeing their oneness and the glory which I gave, I've given to them that they may be one just as we are one, I and them, you and me, that they might be made perfect or mature in one, that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved them. You want to convince the world, it's going to be convinced by a relationship. They're going to see, they're going to see loyalty. They're going to see uh, the same attitudes that were in Jesus, you know, uh, a kind of loyalty that, that sticks it out, that communicates, works through the differences. Don't do a Hallmark one. That doesn't work. I saw it. I saw enough Hallmarks that I know it doesn't work. They, they overhear part, and then they jump to a conclusion, and they fill in the blanks. Whenever people don't know enough information, they fill in the blanks with an opinion. That's where the danger comes in. When you don't have enough proper communication, you fill it in with a guess, an opinion, or a conclusion of your own fabrication. <clears throat> but God's saying, <clears throat> we, we, we've got to begin to see that Jesus is the source of the friendship. Jesus longs for us to know the same oneness with one another. But I just love it. Where two or three are gathered in my name, I am in the midst how could one chase a thousand and two put 10,000 to flight? It's asking a question. How could that happen? It's got to be God in the midst. Well, how do you get God in the midst? If two or more can cut through their differences and come into unity, he's in the midst. And then there's this beautiful spiritual multiplication that takes place. An unbreakable strand, this threefold cord with Jesus in there. I'll tell you what. <clears throat> That relationship with Jesus makes even the best relationships in the world pretty dim when you consider that it's, it's, it's not going to depict the character and the nature of God. It can look good. When you see an unsaved mother, 
loving her unsaved baby. <laughs> that looks good. But in the end, what good is it if they never come to Jesus? What good is it if the strand that bonds them, binds them together is not the bonds of love and the power of the Holy Spirit? One man of you shall chase a thousand, for the Lord your God is he who fights for you as he promised you. That multiplication factor just intrigues me. Who knows what God could do with just two or three? Now, <clears throat> I want to conclude with just uh, some relationship tips. All you note takers, write this down. This is something that uh, I, I think is, is, is powerful. When, uh, <clears throat> when you have yourself as the rule in your life. Belonging, it's all wrapped up in you. I love me, myself, and I. Belonging is a foreign element. You're going to talk about loneliness, which as far as I'm concerned, loneliness is a spirit. It's not just an emotion. But it's all it's me, myself, and I. I want what I want, and I want it now. You'll say you're lonely. The problem is your lack of opening up to relationships that are quality. God has placed the solitary in families, but there's no guarantee they'll cooperate. We're talking even independent people, single people, people who don't, have a mother or father. He still placed you in a spiritual family somewhere. Why don't you know where it's at? You know, your significance. When you're in the flesh, your, your personal significance is all wrapped up in self. You have to create your own significance. And you'll do crazy things to do that sometimes. And lastly, your security. We already learned that in Ecclesiastes 4. Your security is all wrapped up in you and what you will find, the independent person that doesn't have the quality relationships that they should have, they will always feel threatened. Do you know anybody that's always threatened? Are you always threatened? Because that's because of a lack of relationship. No. Three things that we used to say. Uh, we did a teaching some time back on the anatomy of a relationship where this stuff was covered uh, quite thoroughly. But the mission of the creator is for relationship. Relationships are either life or death. You need to write that down. Relationships are either life or death. And the way you relate to God is the way you relate to people. The way you relate to people is the way you relate to God. How do you do at work? How do you do in your neighborhood? How do you do out in public with strangers? The way you relate to people is the way you relate to God. We have a lady in our, our, I pray for her in our neighborhood. She's not a bad person, but when she walks, you, she walks the entire neighborhood, she walks with her head down, and if you walk by, she would never even look up. Very insecure. But I believe she's a lonely person. I don't care if she's married or single. She's lonely. and she, It's like I'm afraid to look up when I'm walking. I'm afraid that you might make eye contact with me. My question is, what are you hiding? Are you so into yourself that your whole security is, I feel threatened by anything that I don't know intimately? Those three things. God wants a relationship. Relationships are either life or death. And we relate to God the same way we relate to people. We relate to people the same way we relate to God. So, Father, search us in the days ahead. Search our hearts. Reveal to us any, any secret fault, things that I'm not even aware of that are blocking me and coming between what you and I have together that would, in, would release me relationally in a more healthy way. In Jesus' name, amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. 
For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.